Uh-oh, NASA's capstone mission is having problems. A new Shepard flight fails. Betelgeuse was recently yellow, and of course, another amazing new image from Webb. All that and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years, and this is our Space Bites, our short updates on all the cool stuff that's happening in space and astronomy this week. All right, let's get into the news. NASA's capstone mission is having problems. Now, we reported on this a couple of months ago that NASA launched the Capstone mission to the moon. And this is a CubeSat mission that's designed to essentially follow in the same trajectory as the upcoming Lunar Gateway to learn all the lessons of what it's like to try and be in this orbit that brings you closer and farther from the moon. What kind of a radiation environment are you in? How, what can you see? What's it going to be like? And it's a fairly long journey. It's going to take many months to get from the Earth to this lunar halo orbit. And we learned last week that NASA is having trouble with the satellite. So what seemed to have happened is that they had a course correction that they were going to be doing. This is totally planned. And instead of the course correction going well, something caused the satellite to tumble. Now, fortunately, NASA has been able to regain contact with the satellite, they were able to get it to go into safe mode. So it's, you know, not running its instruments wildly as it's tumbling. And the good news is that it is actually receiving more energy from the sun that it's expending in all of its various instruments and communication, etc. And so NASA has got time to figure out what the problem is to try and get it to reorient itself, stop whatever tumble it's in, and get it back to doing its mission in time for it to arrive at the moon. So we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's not good to uh, have your spacecraft tumble and not be able to do its job. But it's even worse when you lose contact with your spacecraft. And we're not at that point yet. So we'll keep you posted. Blue Origin had an anomaly in flight. So you know, New Shepard, right? You know, that reusable rocket that flies to the edge of space and back down and it carried Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos to the edge of space. More importantly, it carried William Shatner to the edge of space. And on a recent flight this week, the Blue Origin New Shepard had some kind of anomaly. And about a minute into flight, Blue Origin decided that this rocket was not working properly. They ejected the capsule off of the top and the rocket portion crashed and didn't land safely the way they have been so far. Now we don't know what happened. We haven't received any official word from Blue Origin yet. I'm sure that will be coming and there was nobody on board. This was an uncrewed flight, but it was carrying a collection of science experiments for NASA. Now, ideally, the spacecraft would have flown to its proper altitude would have given the science experiments zero gravity for a little bit so that they could test out whatever they're supposed to test out. And then the capsule would land safely. And then the scientists could retrieve their experiments and learn from that sweet, sweet data. And the problem is that it didn't get a chance to fulfill that flight. So we don't know are the experiments okay? Was any science gained from this? We just don't know. Now this is another reminder that space is hard. This is a rocket, you know, it's a reusable rocket that's supposed to demonstrate that you've got this safe, reliable, reusable way to reach the edge of space. And yet, one flight in dozens completely failed. Now, it didn't fail catastrophically. If there were humans in the capsule, they would have been fine. But it shows you that it's not routine yet. And it's still dangerous. So, you know, just another reminder that space is dangerous and space is difficult. Ancient astronomers saw a yellow Betelgeuse. Of course, Betelgeuse has been on our minds for the last couple of years. And that's because back in 2019, the star dimmed. And like, you could see it, you could go outside. And if you were familiar with the constellation of Orion, you could look at the shoulder and you could see that the star was dramatically dimmer than you were accustomed to it being. And people wondered what was going on. Was it that the star was about to explode? Turned out no, uh, it was actually a giant sunspot 
area on Betelgeuse and had blobbed out a bunch of dust that was obscuring our view to the star and making it look dimmer. And then that dust cleared away and we were able to see the star as it was again. So we didn't really get a sense of where Betelgeuse is in his evolutionary history, but astronomers slash historians discovered an incredible piece of historical information about Betelgeuse that allowed them to figure out both the mass of the star and its age and where it is on its evolutionary cycle. So what they did was they looked back in historical texts for any reference to Betelgeuse, and they found a reference by a Chinese astronomer. And the astronomer said that this Betelgeuse was yellow. And now then later on, you had Ptolemy observe Betelgeuse in 2 AD. And he said that Betelgeuse was kind of yellowish red. And then you had Tycho Brahe in the 1600s say that Betelgeuse was red, very red, redder than Aldebaran. And so you've got this continuity from yellow to yellowish red to red. And so Betelgeuse has been changing in recorded history, which is it's amazing when you think about that. But anyway, so you take this color change. And what this did was this allowed astronomers to understand what kind of a star Betelgeuse is, they calculated that it is 14 times more massive than the sun based on the way it's evolving and the pace that it's evolving. And also based on that mass, it is about 14 million years old. So you know, there's a very familiar, very famous diagram, we talked about it before the Hertzsprung Russell diagram that places stars on this continuum. And really, if you know the color of the star, the temperature of the star, that will tell you where it is along the evolutionary process. So we know that Betelgeuse is 14 million years old. And based on how stars like it are expected to live, it has about another 1.5 million years left to live before it explodes as a supernova. So obviously, this isn't concrete evidence, you can't be 100% certain that the Chinese astronomer was writing down and recording things properly and correctly, maybe he was colorblind, who knows. But it looks like Betelgeuse isn't going to explode any day now, it's going to explode in about a million and a half years. Really cool, really interesting. It's raining diamonds on the ice giants and in the lab. Now one of the coolest ideas when you think about the ice giant planets Uranus and Neptune is that they rain diamonds inside of them. Now, how does this work, right? You've got these various layers of ices inside Uranus and Neptune. And as you go deeper into the planet, the temperatures and the pressures rise. And when it gets high enough, carbon atoms are glued together by the high temperature and pressure into larger structures, diamonds. And then over time, as these objects are like snowflakes, right, like raindrops, they grow to a certain size, they get heavier and heavier, and they fall into the deeper layers of the planet. And as they do, the temperatures and the pressures continue to rise. And the temperature tears these diamonds apart at a molecular level. And all of the carbon atoms fly back up into the atmosphere, reform into diamonds again, and then fall again, or at least that's the theory. And obviously, you know, like, how are you going to go hundreds, thousands of kilometers into the heart of one of these ice giants to confirm this? very tricky, bring an umbrella. But scientists have been able to recreate the conditions inside Uranus and Neptune, but in the lab. And so what they did was they took a kind of plastic, and they were able to put it under the same temperature and pressure that they believe are inside these ice giants. And they're able to tear apart the carbon in this plastic down to a molecular level, and then get these particles to start gluing together, kind of like diamonds, but they were able to do it for a fraction of a second before they fell apart again. But still, it's a tantalizing hint that this same situation is happening. What they saw in the lab is what's happening inside these planets. Solar Orbiter was hit by a coronal mass ejection. Solar telescopes were able to observe a giant coronal mass ejection blast off the sun in the last couple of weeks. And this coronal mass ejection headed straight for planet Venus and engulfed the planet and then continued moving off into space, which can happen. I mean, we know these mass ejections come towards the Earth as well. And I guess Venus is closer. So it happens more often. But 
what was a coincidence is that the European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter spacecraft was currently doing a gravitational assist flyby of planet Venus when the coronal mass ejection hit. Good timing. Bad timing? Well, it was good timing because the spacecraft is designed for this. I mean, this is its job to get close to the sun, to observe the sun, to bathe in the waves and particles that are coming from the sun, all in the name of science. Now, the problem is, is that while it was doing this flyby, controllers at ESA turned off a bunch of its instruments because it was too close to Venus. Venus is very bright, and they were worried that they were going to get this reflected light that was going to sort of hamper their sensors while they were focusing on doing this flyby. And so they didn't think it was going to be necessary. And so it wasn't operating with all of its science instruments going, but still it had some operational. And when this coronal mass ejection passed it, when all of these particles, protons, electrons flew past, it was able to taste the particle flavor. I'm sure that's not exactly what happened scientifically, but something to that effect, it was able to sense the environment around itself and send that data back home. And hopefully next time this happens, they'll be more ready, it'll have all of the instruments on board. But still, we don't have a lot of times when a spacecraft designed to observe the solar environment to designed to observe particles coming from the sun actually get hit by these particles and is able to do its job. So scientists will probably be crunching this data for years to come and hopefully it gets hit again. <laughs> like again, it's designed to do this. Don't worry. Super detailed picture of the sun. You're looking at a picture of the sun. And this photo was taken by the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope, which is on the top of Haleakala on the Hawaiian island of Maui. And this is a four meter solar telescope. Its only job is to stare at the sun. And it is the most powerful solar telescope that's ever been built. I did a whole episode on the Daniel K. Inoue telescope. It is crazy. Like the, the most difficult part is like, how do you point at the sun and get rid of all the heat coming from pointing a telescope mirror at the sun? It's it's not simple. But uh, and so this telescope has now been in its first initial observing phase for the first year or so. And to celebrate that, the scientists release this image of the sun. And the each pixel, the resolution of this image is 18 kilometers, the width of this image is about 80,000 kilometers across. And so you're seeing features on the sun down to 18 kilometers in, in size, which we have nothing else that's able to do this kind of resolution. The picture is showing a region of the sun's lower atmosphere called the chromosphere. And this is where temperatures can rise to about 7200 Celsius, very hot. And what's really cool about this, you know, we talked about the solar orbiter spacecraft, we haven't talked about Parker solar probe for a few weeks. And then you got the Daniel K Inouye, you've got these three separate, I guess, telescope two satellites able to observe the sun at the same time. And so you can see a feature say a coronal mass ejection getting blasted off, maybe Parker solar probe will fly through it. Solar Orbiter will see it from the top view and the Daniel K Inoue will see it from the Earth in different wavelengths. And so scientists can combine all of these images together and really understand in almost three dimensions across different wavelengths, what's happening on the sun and how that has a chance to impact the Earth. But like, it's just a bit like, it's just an amazing picture. And you can see an image of the Earth to scale and you can see how small the Earth is compared to the sun, like, were insignificant. And yet, the resolution is incredible. It's it's a mind blowing image. And I can't wait to see more of the pictures coming from this telescope. Here's one of the web pictures you've been waiting for. Alright, well, it wouldn't be space bites if we didn't showcase a new picture from the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is highly anticipated. This is the picture you've been waiting for, even though you didn't know you were waiting for it. And this is the Orion Nebula, a very famous star formation complex that is relatively close to the Earth. Like I think last week, we showed off the Tarantula Nebula, which is 180,000 kilometers away. The Orion Nebula is about 1300 light years away. So it's just in our backyard. 
And this is a picture of a region of the Orion Nebula called the Orion Bar. And you've got this wave of dust and material that kind of goes diagonally across the image. And then you've got these two bright stars that are down at the bottom. And you can compare this to an image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, just for, for like where in the Orion Nebula are you looking at? And just above, you've got the trapezium. This is these four really bright young stars that are shining with enormous intensity. And in fact, like when you take a picture of the Orion Nebula with the telescope, though the trapezium will sort of blow out your image and make it so that it's completely overexposed, you have to decide like, do I want to take a picture of the middle of the Orion Nebula? Or do I want to try and get that faint nebulosity around the outside of it. And in this case, we're now looking at the Orion bar, which is part of the nebula and a little just down into the left. And Again, what is amazing is that Webb can see through the gas and dust that obscures the star forming regions inside the Orion Nebula. And it's the Orion Nebula is all about star forming. And so you can see little knots with brand new stars inside. You can see through these ripples of gas and dust that are obscured from view. And when you compare the image from the Hubble Space Telescope to this one, like it just feels like the focus is clear, you're getting more clarity. And, you know, this is a like a comment and feedback that I get from a lot of people that that they see these pictures from James Webb, and they want to be excited, they want to have their mind blown, but they're just not feeling it like it's they're not seeing something as exciting as they were expecting to see. And like, how could you I mean, it is four times better in resolution than the Hubble Space Telescope. It's taking things that are blurry and making them clear. But also like space is fractal. Like, you know, when you look at the Tarantula Nebula, 130,000 light years away, and the Orion Nebula, 1300 light years away, one one hundredth the distance, they both kind of look like big nebula. And yet we're seeing these two objects that are dramatically different distances from us here on Earth. And so what matters is the science, what matters is the details that the astronomers are able to pull out the clear signals of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of a planet or the a really solid dating of when you're seeing a galaxy just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And all those images are beautiful what really matters is the underlying scientific data that this is revealing to astronomers. And I promise you, they are losing their minds over how good this data is and how much this is going to help them push their science forward. So anyway, that's a little context in these kind of images, but just like enjoy the Orion Nebula. All right. Those were all the news stories that we had this week. Thank you everyone for hanging out with me. Now, if you want to get more information on any of the stories that I covered today, you can find links to everything in the show notes below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word. There's no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universe today.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all our news, interviews, question and answer shows, as well as special exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And a huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, those were all the stories that we had this week. I hope you enjoyed them. Tasty, tasty space bites. We'll see you next week.